Stranger Paradise honestly blindsided me. Its initial reveal was pretty raw, lots of fast-paced hardcore action, screaming, and a clashing aesthetic of gothic new metal fantasy, all centered around an alternate retelling of the original Final Fantasy. The demo was broken on launch, and it looked and ran like shit too. A few months later, we get more insight on the game, with a significant rework showing off a lot of promising mechanics. Still, even with this much coverage and hands-on, it felt like it wasn't enough for people to get sold on it. IMO, I think it's partly due to the game journalists and industry insiders initially fabricating rumors of this game being a Soulsborne style game before its reveal, which fucking meant that everyone and their mother is going to compare this game to Elden Ring when it released. And while sure, you can draw parallels to Teen Ninja's last work, hell, it even has reused assets with UI and animations, it must be dense if you're expecting some slow burn dark fantasy game taking itself seriously. Strangers is a lot better than that. Just SOP uses Neo as a springboard for a more faster paced and mechanically rich character action game. You got your guides and parries, fast and slow stance options, and stamina draining attacks that result in the most satisfying finishers on par with Doom. Seems pretty basic at first, especially when you're starting off with a default loadout. What's so great about it? Well, you take this framework and just fucking cram Final Fantasy V onto it. For all the zoomers out there, FF5 had this unique battle system wherein you can switch job classes on a whim with any party member. You got your warrior, your mage, your thief. Bar. Each of these jobs can be leveled up unlocking abilities as well as even more jobs. But on top of that, they also offered both active abilities that would carry over universally with any other job. So you can mix and match your heart's content, going all in on main maxing, finding exploits, or just experimenting with different playstyles offering near bottomless replayability. This entire system is lifted and adapted into a more active framework where you can assign four universal abilities on a meter while being able to switch two job classes on the fly with different weapon loadouts each one having its own playstyle. And yes, you can cancel and combo with them to your heart's content, shit's pretty good. Now individual jobs also have their own playstyles, incentivizing you to play them with exclusive abilities and passive buffs which are too much to list off and I'm not wasting my time capturing footage for all these. Some jobs synergize more than others, but you're guaranteed to find a perfect match that fits your playstyle, potentially breaking the game. For example, I ended up breezing through it using the Monk class paired with a leveled up Brit Mage where I'd get crazy attack buffs off of Monk, then cast Haste 3 on myself and just fucking SPEED through everything. I also used a Marauder ability called Blood Punch that healed as much damage dealt so I can land a few quick punches for instant recovery. Even though these setups sound busted, the game won't let you wail on everything. For one, it can punish you hard for treating it like a platinum game. Attacks don't really have iframes, same goes for combo abilities. Enemies are tough to stagger, so you have to be careful knowing when to attack and when to play defensively. This process can be sped up by a parry meter that drains quickly if used openly, but can last a while if you know when to time it. It causes an instant stagger when it lands, making it a perfect opening. Though you still have to be careful against the red command grabs and AoEs, as they can create an empty meter and cause a guard break, where you lose all your abilities leaving you open for a hard rim. Good luck getting Daigo parries fighting Tom Berries. Purple attacks can be absorbed and fired back, which are perfect for draining stamina or exploiting elemental weaknesses. Some stages even have interactions like burning bushes or sapping a pool of water, though it's quickly forgotten in later stages. Such stages are pretty serviceable, but nothing really that special. They're all styled after previous FF games. Some picks are iconic, like the underwater Mako reactor from 7, the pirate coat from 14, the evil forest from 9, but then some are like... <laughs> So we're like, the fucking fire cavern from Final Fantasy VIII? <laughs> While they're all adapted faithfully, some of them can be really basic and not that diverse, especially in later levels that turn into giant mazes getting rid of any environmental set pieces or interactions. The floating continent is still an ugly, unnavigatable piece of shit. But hey, their server someone is ready to punch it in, but that's more of a boss fights thing. And that's where the real test of skill lies, and it's unfortunately very hit or miss. A handful of fights rely on annoying AoEs or just plain barriers to set up where you can't even harm the boss unless you're a magic caster whittling away at their health. Tiamat, while awesome and a true test of your reaction time, can also turn into a test of your patience with the way it regens health until you find a perfect combo to drain your stamina or just hold it out until it caps. But to no one's surprise, the best fights are the ones on an even playing field, like the first Garland fight with his elemental attacks that can be negated by casting the opposite effect. BK with his brutal wind-up axe attacks, and Astos teleporting around and shooting dark magic from every direction. These all feel fast-paced and intense, requiring perfect timing for optimal aggressive play. 
And I know I already shed on the rod and dragon, but who the fuck composed this? The tone of this game can honestly be all over the place at times. We got bits of humor, sometimes intentional, sometimes <laughs> very <laughs> unintentional. Chad, Protag, Jack, as crew of bros, Twink, and Stink set off on an adventure to become the Warriors of Light. And, along the way, they meet a rejected Nier character and Giga Stacy. Interaction with these characters feel pretty stiff and awkward, both in and out of cutscenes, and I honestly can't tell if it's meant to be intentional or not. For about 80% of the game, Jack isn't just angry because of chaos, he's just like that. He says so himself. He's an asshole and makes his party members feel like they're talking to a wall to the point where they're often discouraged and afraid to talk to him. Honestly, it's, it's fucking incredible. Though what he doesn't have in bands, he has him grunting out loud whenever he buffs himself. I feel like his cartoonish demeanor is also propped up by the fanbase around this game that tries to sell it as some pseudo-ironic, ultra-self-aware, cringe Kino parody of itself that makes it look childish and vapid when, in reality, the game manages to shine with passionate earnesty on top of its edgy aesthetic. That being said, the pacing can be a little too fast in regard to how quick you go through levels and bosses without any introduction or backstory, while others, mainly the fiends, get full treatment. In regards to character development, it almost feels like it has some gaps missing. If you know anything, anything about Final Fantasy 1, you know this is all leading up to Jack going demon mode with his fiends. So it acts on the pretense of these relationships being pre-established, yet everyone feels distant with no meaningful bickering or bonding outside of throwaway lines of remarks. It's only until the last two stages of the game where these characters have some meaningful weight with it culminating in you slaughtering them. And I could dunk on the writing as much as I want, but the final boss having Jack scream out his evil enraged monologue while pummeling the ever-loving Christ out of evil manifest has got to be the pinnacle of action game Kino. Overall, I just wish this world and its characters were just more fleshed out and given more depth with smaller moments or just more input when tackling the game's main conflict, which also feel like it's barely explained. And yes, I know there's loading screens and archives you pick up around levels that can tell you everything about it. Am I gonna read it? No. But on the same note of extras, the game isn't over after you roll credits. You now have access to Chaos Mode, an extra difficulty that boosts attack values and stamina drains of enemies to obscene levels. It has the added effect of inverting the difficulty spike in where smaller mobs pose a greater threat than the bosses that are now easily exploitable. It's more than just another difficulty option, as it also offers better armor drops to increase affinity values and unlock some honestly broken passive buffs for each job that you'll need, you'll need to survive a lot of these fights. There's also an option for multiplayer that, while fun, turns the game too easy, IMO. Prefer for carrying your girlfriend through it. Strangers of Paradise blindsided me. It's a fucking near masterpiece of a game in my eyes. The amount of variety it has to offer with approach to play style options and customizability therein is something on the same level as God Hand. Allowing for infinite replayability and experimentation that's lasted me hundreds of hours. Something that no other action game can provide even when achieving near mastery of its mechanics. I'd even say it's one of the best games in the last decade. And while it's definitely missing the big flashy graphics and set pieces, crazy choreography and character moments, it manages to resonate with me a lot stronger on a smaller scale with its charismatically blunt writing chaotic approach to action, and as a retrospective celebration of the Final Fantasy series ending on a bittersweet but heartfelt note, Stranger Paradise is a misunderstood gem of a game, one that if you decide to seek out, will leave you with an unforgettable experience.